Good evening aspirants welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy for the date 29th of August 2022 Before seeing the list of news articles I have an announcement for you See pre storming test series batch 1 is going to start at Shankar AS Academy's Annanagar branch The test series consists of a total of 66 test It includes both CSAT GS and mock test The batch starts on 12th September 2022 and all the test will be conducted in offline mode on the scheduled dates from 2 pm to 4 pm and it will be followed by a live discussion from 4:30 pm to 7:30 pm the students who missed the offline test can take the test online after 2 days for students who are taking the test online will be provided recorded discussion videos you can take the test online only until the start of shankar as academy's mock test that will be held before prelims 2023 Now with this information let us see the list of news articles that we will be discussing today you can go through it Now let us start our discussion. Look at this news article. It talks about a high-tech farm in Kerala, which will be promoted as a tourist hotspot. So through this, the Kerala state government is popularizing agro tourism. In this context, we will be discussing about the agro tourism industry in India. First, let us see what is agro tourism. Agro tourism is a form of rural tourism. In this, tourist stays with the farmer. then engages with the farming activities and also eats authentic farm food so it involves staying in a farm house or a separate guest house such farm house or guest house will provide meals and also includes activities involving observing and participating in farming operation for instance such activities include strawberry picking this activity is already carried out as a part of agro tourism in mahabaleshwar of maharashtra so from this what we can understand is agro tourism is a kind of leisure activity that is done in an agricultural environment and it also provide opportunity to help farming while staying in a farming area also know that this concept has been derived from the western economies Now let us come to the benefits associated with agro tourism. First, it provides opportunity for the farmer to earn extra income because it has the potential to become a allied agricultural activity. Second, it helps in redistribution of economic resources from urban part of the country to the rural part. Third, it also helps in job creation for rural youth and women. Through this, it reduces disguised unemployment what is disguised unemployment see disguised unemployment is a case in which people appear to be employed it occurs when productivity is low and too many workers are filling too few jobs it could also mean when part of a population is not employed at their full potential and this type of unemployment is very common in rural india now in case of agro tourism the rural people will be actually employed other than this from the side of the tourist if you see they get authentic village experience or experience of village culture we know generally it is hard for a city dweller to experience village life then it also helps both tourist and farmers to interact with each other through this they cultivate relationship and understand each other's need also agro tourism benefits the environment and biodiversity because it is ecologically sustainable and environmentally friendly above all it helps to diversify india's conventional tourism industry and add new dimension to it see these are the advantages associated with agro tourism see there are some challenges associated with agro tourism now let us see the challenges first of all investment needed in this is very high because the cost of land development is quite high and there is also need for huge initial investment there is the challenge of human resources this is due to the weak communication skills of the staff in rural part of the country so this might affect the experience of tourism thirdly 
the experience of agro tourism might turn monotonous monotonous in the sense that there is inability to introduce more engaging activity other than farming related activities and finally at the policy level in india we lack a specific central or state government policy to promote agro tourism a good policy measure is needed for the proper implementation and regulation of the agro tourism industry with this basic understanding let us see what the news article says the news article talks about kuriyottumalla farm located in kollam district of kerala now this farm is going to be opened as a high tech agro tourist destination for public from august 31st it is located in a completely rural area near a tribal colony the facilities include cottages huts children's park and life sized animal structure to attract tourists a first of a kind domestic animal museum is going to be added in the facility in the near future through this kuriyottamalla farm aims to tap tourism potential along with the development of the area and generating employment for residents so that's all regarding this discussion see this example of the kuriyottamalla farm can be used in your main answer when the question asks us about agro tourism so this is how you have to pick articles from the news and use it as a value addition in your main answer so that's all regarding this discussion let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this news article this news article is about rabies see there is a sudden spurt in human rabies death in the state of kerala this year this had included cases where the victims were vaccinated so this has raised questions about the vaccine potency possibility of poor vaccine cold chain mechanism and above all the efficacy of the intradermal route of vaccine administration and the fallibility of the intradermal route of vaccine administration here intradermal vaccination is the delivery of vaccines into the outer layer of the skin most vaccines are delivered via the intramuscular route the intradermal route is used only for a few number of vaccines like rabies and bcg this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn about the rabies disease see rabies is a fatal but preventable viral disease the virus that is responsible for causing this disease is the lysa virus it is a single stranded rna virus and it comes under the rabidoviridae family rabies can spread to people and pets if they are bitten or scratched by a rabid animal in the united states rabies is mostly found in wild animals like bats raccoons skunks and foxes however in many other countries dogs still carry rabies virus and most rabies deaths in the world is caused due to dog bites now comes a question how is this rabies transmitted rabies virus is transmitted through direct contact such as through broken skin or mucous membranes in the eyes nose or mouth with saliva of the infected animal see people usually get rabies from the bite of a rabid animal it is also possible but rare for people to get rabies from non bite exposure also which include scratches abrasion and open wounds that are exposed to saliva or other potential infectious material from a rabid animal see generally during localized infection the virus is shed from the primary site of infection here primary site is nothing but the bite site and it spreads and multiplies itself causing the disease just have a look at this image here you can see how a dog is getting infected from a already infected animal the spot where the bite happens is the primary site of infection from there the virus spreads and multiplies rapidly causing the disease see the rabies virus infects the central nervous system how see the rabies virus attacks the nervous tissue and appears to replicate almost exclusively in the neuronal cells once introduced through the skin or mucous membrane the virus begins replicating in the striated muscles at the wound site the virus can replicate in muscle cells for hours or weeks or it can migrate immediately to the nervous system and most importantly rabies virus becomes non infectious when it dries out and when it is exposed to sunlight 
that is in general if the material containing the virus is dry the virus cannot be considered infectious okay having seen the transmission now let us see what is to be done after transmission that is what can be done after a person is infected by the virus see if a person does not receive appropriate medical care after a potential rabies exposure the virus can cause disease in the brain ultimately resulting in death okay you may think how it affects the brain see as i already said the virus starts moving from the primary site of infection that is the bite site to the brain in the brain the virus infects the neurons in almost all brain regions and here it continues replication neuronal virus transmission from the periphery of the body that is the bite site to the brain is called centripetal virus spread this is making the rabies the deadliest disease known to mankind see in general the incubation period for rabies is 2 to 3 months but it may vary from 1 week to 1 year depending upon the factors such as location of virus entry and viral load so if a rabid dog bites a person it may take about 1 year for the virus to reach the brain cells from the bite sites okay know that the initial symptoms of rabies include fever with pain and unusual or unexplained tingling pricking or burning sensation at the wound site but as the virus spread to the central nervous system progressive and fatal inflammation of the brain and spinal cord develops once the virus start infecting the central nervous system and the brain this stage is called the acute neurologic stage this stage has some certain symptoms associated with it the symptoms include confusion aggression partial paralysis involuntary muscle twitching rigid neck muscles convulsions frothing at the mouth fear of water or hydrophobia hallucinations nightmare insomnia and photophobia here photophobia is the fear of light so these are the symptoms associated with rabies now moving on see though the virus is the deadliest it can be treated yes immediate treatment of a bite victim after rabies exposure can prevent the entry of the virus into the central nervous system this is called post exposure prophylaxis post exposure prophylaxis in rabies consist of regimes of rabies immunoglobulin serum and full courses of rabies vaccination at 0 3 7 14 and 28 days the first dose of vaccination should be given as soon as possible immediately after the animal bite see firstly there should be extensive washing and local treatment of the bite wound or scratch as soon as possible after the suspected exposure secondly a course of potent and effective rabies vaccine that meets who standards has to be given and then administration of rabies immunoglobulin serum should be done if indicated this is given because the virus in the wound is neutralized through the administration of the rabies immunoglobulin in the wound site this will give passive protection to the bite victim till the vaccine produces antibodies to fight the virus okay so starting the treatment as soon as after the exposure to rabies virus can effectively prevent the onset of symptoms and even should death okay other than this let me tell you how you can be totally prevented because prevention is always better than cure right see rabies can be prevented by vaccinating the pets and staying away from wildlife and seeking medical care after potential exposure before the symptoms starts okay see considering the severity of the disease rabies is included in who's new 2021 2030 road map as a zoonotic disease it requires close cross sectoral coordination at the national regional and global levels so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we discussed various points about the rabies disease we saw what causes the disease the symptoms of the disease the mode of transmission and how the disease can be prevented so that's all regarding this discussion with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article take a look at this article see this article talks about aadhar card and its linkage with voter id card so in this article discussion 
let us see about some of the basics of aadhar card and then we shall see some of the important points mentioned in the article before getting into the discussion i have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion please go through it now let us start our discussion let us start with aadhar card as you know aadhar is a 12 digit individual identification number issued by the unique identification authority of india on the behalf of government of india this number will serve as a proof of identity and address anywhere in india that is any individual irrespective of age and gender who is a resident in india and satisfies the verification process laid down by the uidai can enroll for aadhar here you must note two things firstly to enroll for aadhar he or she need not be a citizen of india being resident in india is alone enough for enrollment here a resident is a person who has resided in india for 182 days in one year preceding the date of application for enrollment for aadhar so at any case aadhar number cannot be a proof of citizenship or domicile secondly any individual irrespective of age and gender meaning even children right from their birth can be enrolled for aadhar but for children below 5 years no biometric will be captured later when they turn 5 and 15 the unique identification of the children have to be updated with their biometrics of 10 fingers iris and facial photograph so for this alerts will be sent to the registered mobile number of their parents okay now coming back each individual needs to enroll only once which is free of cost and each aadhar number will be unique to an individual and will remain valid for life also remember aadhar letter received through india post and e aadhar downloaded from uida website are equally valid now you must know the purpose of aadhar why such a document is required see aadhar was introduced with two primary goals in mind first is to curb leakages through targeted delivery see earlier various identity proof like ration card driver license or voter id were required for access to government benefits subsidies and services but the issue with these proof is that they could be easily duplicated or forged this led to leakages of benefits and subsidies to ineligible beneficiaries so government brought in aadhar number aadhar number is based on biometric information like photograph 10 fingerprints scans of both irises and demographic information like name date of birth gender residential address the thing is we cannot duplicate or forge biometric information so ultimately aadhar helps in ensuring elimination of duplicates under various schemes and it enables seamless implementation of direct benefit transfer programs to the targeted population so this is the first intention behind the implementation of aadhar card second is to improve efficiency and efficacy of the service delivery mechanism see the aadhar number the demographic and biometric information all together are stored in the central identities data repository and every time a person's identity is authenticated using aadhar information related to the authentication request is stored as well this authentication allows the implementing agencies to verify beneficiaries at the time of service or benefit delivery and it guarantees benefits are delivered to the right people so this is the second purpose as the time has passed by aadhar number was made mandatory to access services like banking mobile phone connection and other government and non government services this includes linking aadhar with pan card some of the other places where aadhar is used is highlighted here in the box just go through it now coming back to the news article see the news article reports to us some of the instances where block level officers have asked individuals to link their aadhar with their voter ids telling them if they fail their voter ids could be cancelled so here comes two questions first is why does the government want the linking of aadhar with the voter id see the answer to this question is very simple the election commission conducts regular exercises to maintain an updated and accurate record of the voter base a part of this exercise is to weed out duplication of voters like migrant workers 
who may have been registered more than once on the electoral rolls in different constituencies or persons registered multiple times within the same constituency as per the government linkage of aadhar with voter ids will assist in ensuring that only one voter id is issued per citizen in india this is why government and the election commission are insisting to link aadhar with voter id the second question is is the linking of aadhar id with one's voter id mandatory and if we fail to do so does the election commission have authority to cancel one's voter id the answer to this is no see linking of aadhar with one's voter id is not mandatory and citing that as the reasons the election commission cannot cancel one's voter id this is as per election laws amendment act 2021 this amendment act amended the representation of people's act 1950 and inserted section 23 class 4 this section states that aadhar can be used only for the purpose of establishing the identity of any person and as per form 6b issued under rule 26b of the registration of elector rules 1960 the voter may submit either their aadhar number to the electoral registration officer or any other listed document but the option to submit other listed documents is exercisable only if the voter is not able to furnish their aadhar number because they do not have an aadhar number so this might have been misinterpreted and have caused confusion among the people and the block level officers having understood this now let us see what are all the operational difficulties in linking aadhar to the voter id Firstly the preference of aadhar for the purpose of determining voters is misleading this is because aadhar is only a proof of residence and not a proof of citizenship so verifying voter identity against this will only help in tackling duplication but it will not remove voters who are not citizens of india from the electoral rolls secondly the estimate of error rates in biometric based authentication differs widely as per the unique identification authority of india in 2018 aadhar based biometric authentication had a 12% error rate just because aadhar based authentication could not take place a person should not be denied of their benefit like voting lastly civil society has highlighted that linking of two database of electoral rolls and aadhar could lead to the linkage of aadhar's demographic information with voter id information further that might lead to the creation of a surveillance state so here we lack proper enforceable data protection principle and how the authenticated data will be used is a big question mark so these are the operational difficulties in linking aadhar card to the voter id so to conclude the government should make corrections in form 6b and you should clarify that linking of aadhar and voter id is not mandatory along with that the government should also expedite the enactment of the data protection legislation that addresses concerns of unauthorized processing of personal data stored by the government and all that india needs is an enforceable data protection principle that regulates how authenticated data will be used so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw the basics about aadhar and we saw why the government mandated the linking of aadhar and the voter id and we also saw the difficulties in linking aadhar with voter id so i hope this discussion was helpful with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the last article for our discussion have a look at this article this article talks about s subramaniam balaji vs tamil nadu judgment see this is a judgment regarding promises made during elections which are termed freebies at times See in this judgment a supreme court division bench held that making promises in election manifesto do not amount to corrupt practices this is under section 123 of the representation of people's act okay see regarding freebies we have already covered exclusively if you could remember we discussed the ins and outs of freebies on our august 20 2022 hindu news analysis session and while discussing we saw about supreme court recommendations too what did the supreme court recommend the supreme court recommended creating an apex authority this is to provide recommendations on how to regulate gifts given out by political parties and now the supreme court referred to a three judge bench to revisit its 
earlier judgment which is the S. Subramaniam Balaji vs. Tamil Nadu judgment. It is unique as the court is exploring whether judicial parameters can be set on a purely political act of promising freebies. Okay, in this context, let us discuss about this S. Subramaniam Balaji vs. Tamil Nadu judgment. And then let us see what is the significance of this judgment in the context of the current debate surrounding freebies by political parties. First, let us see what triggered this Balaji case. The whole event started in the year 2006. This is during the Tamil Nadu Assembly elections. The Dravidam Munetra Kalagam released its election manifesto announcing a scheme for free distribution of color televisions to every Tamil Nadu household. The party justified that the TV would provide recreation and general knowledge to household women, more particularly those living in the rural areas. The party swept to power in the polls and decided to implement this scheme. While doing so, they spent 750 crores from the budget for the project. Then in the year 2011, All India Anna Dravidam Munnetra Kalaham, that is AADMK, with its alliance, also announced its election manifesto with free gifts to equalize the gifts offered by the DMK government. AADMK promised grinders, mixies, electric fans, laptops, computers, 4 gram gold thalis, thali in Tamil means Mangal Sutra, a check of 50,000 for women marriages, green houses, 20 kg of rice to ration card holders and free cattle and sheep. Note that here the 20 kg rice was promised even to those above the poverty line. Then after that a petition was filed by Mr. Balaji who is a resident of Tamil Nadu. He challenged the schemes introduced by the parties in the Madras High Court. He said the expenditure to be incurred by the state from the exchequer was unauthorized, impermissible and against the constitutional mandates. But the High Court dismissed his case, so he moved to the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court, he argued that the promise of free distribution of non-essential commodities in the election manifesto amounts to electoral bribe under Section 123 of the Representation of People's Act. Then he also mentioned that the distribution of goods to certain sections of the people was violative of the Article 14 of the Constitution. In response to this argument, the state of Tamil Nadu said the promises of the political parties during the election do not constitute corrupt practices. Then the Tamil Nadu government claimed that the promises implemented by the party after forming the government is an obligation under the directive principles of state policy. So the Tamil Nadu government claimed that the promise of freebies cannot be construed as a waste of public money or it cannot be prohibited by any statute or scheme. Now coming to the judgment. The Supreme Court said that the manifesto of the political party is a statement of its policy. So it said that making promises in election manifesto do not amount to a corrupt practice under section 123 of the Representation of People's Act. However, the court agreed that the freebies create an uneven playing field. So, it had asked the Election Commission of India to consult political parties and issue guidelines on the election manifesto. And it asked the Election Commission to make it a part of the model code of conduct. Now, why is the Supreme Court's move to review the Balaji judgment significant? See, the Supreme Court thinks that because of freebies, the state governments cannot provide basic amenities. This is because they will lack funds and the state will be pushed towards imminent bankruptcy. So, the Supreme Court wants to analyze whether an enforceable judicial order can stop political parties from promising and distributing irrational freebies. So, that's all regarding this discussion. See, this judgment, that is the Subramaniam Balaji, the state of Tamil Nadu judgment, can be used in your main answer in arguments favoring freebies. Okay? So that's all regarding this discussion. With this, we have come to the end of the news analysis session. Now let us take up the practice prelims questions. We have four prelims questions. Let us see them one by one. Let us take up the first question. This is a previous year question and it appeared on the 2018 prelims paper. Two statements are given. We have to find the correct statement. Let us take up the first statement. Aadhaar card can be used as a proof of citizenship or domicile. See, this statement is wrong. We saw in our discussion that Aadhaar card cannot be used as a proof of citizenship. 
So, statement 1 is wrong. Now, let us take up the second statement. Once issued, Aadhaar number cannot be deactivated or omitted by the issuing authority. This statement is also wrong because the Aadhaar number can be deactivated or omitted by the issuing authority. Since both the statements are wrong, the correct answer here is option D, neither one nor two. Now, moving on to the second question. This is also a two statement question. Two statements regarding model code of conduct is given. We have to find the correct answers. Let us take up the first statement. It is framed by the Supreme Court. See, this statement is incorrect. The model code of conduct is a set of guidelines issued by the Election Commission of India for the conduct of the political parties and candidates during elections. Now, moving on to the second statement. It is binding on all political parties. See, this statement is correct. The norm of the model code of conduct have been evolved with the consensus of the political parties who have consented to abide by the principles embodied in the model code of conduct. So, the model code of conduct is binding on all political parties. So, here statement 1 is incorrect and statement 2 is correct. So, the correct answer here is option B, 2 only. Moving on to the third question. This question is regarding rabies. Two statements are given. We have to find the correct statement. Let us take the first statement. Rabies has 100% fatality when untreated. See, this statement is correct. Because when rabies is untreated and the Lysa virus reaches the central nervous system, the fatality is 100%. Okay, so statement 1 is correct. Now let us take up the second statement. Rabies virus causes encephalitis. See, this statement is also correct. We saw that once the Lysa virus enters the central nervous system, it will cause swelling of the spinal cord and the brain. This condition, that is the swelling of spinal cord and brain is called encephalitis. So, here also statement 1 and statement 2 is correct. So, the correct answer here is option C, both 1 and 2. Now, let us take up the last question. See, this question is a two statement question regarding agrotourism. This is a quiz question for you. Read the question and post the answers in the comment section. The main question based on today's discussion is displayed here. Write the answer and post it in the comment section. If you like today's discussion, like, comment and share the video with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.